All right, this morning, I'm actually going to continue our series in the book of John. Uh, Jason asked me to take the next section um, so that on Easter Sunday, we don't leave Jesus in the, in the tomb. So we'll make sure we get him out of there. No, he's already, he's already gone. He's resurrected. I don't have any power over that. Um, but we are going to be in John 18, John 18, 1 through 27 this morning. Um, Jesus, in, in the previous section, Jesus had just finished a lengthy section of teaching in chapters 13 through 16 with some really difficult material. And then he gives this beautiful kind of high priestly prayer in John 17. And today we're going to look at the next part of John 18. And in this passage, we're going to have, uh, we're going to read about Jesus's arrest. We're going to read about one of Jesus's trials. And we're also going to read about uh, Peter denying Jesus three times. So John 18, 1 through 27, follow along with me as I read this out loud. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First, they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be more expedient that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept the watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? And he said, I am not. Now the servants and officers made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, if what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, to Caiaphas the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing, warming himself. And so they said to him, are also, you also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man who, whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it 
And at once, the rooster crowed. Would you pray with me once again? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that you would guard us from itching ears this morning, God. We pray that you would give us ears to hear what you have for us and hearts that are willing to submit and worship you. We pray these things in Jesus. Amen. Well, in verse 1, when Jesus had finished his teaching, he and his disciples left the city. They headed east across the Kidron, and uh, they went up to the Mount of Olives. And on the Mount of Olives, they go into an olive grove or a garden, and they enter this garden. Jesus and his disciples have gone together. And verse 2 tells us that this is important for us to know because the time of Jesus had finally come. Judas, who had been one of Jesus' 12 closest disciples, determined to betray Jesus. He procured a band of Roman soldiers and Jewish temple police. The Romans and the Jews were working together to put an end to the ministry of Jesus. And so Judas led this new makeshift mob, armed with torches and lanterns and weapons, to the garden where he knew Jesus would be. Many of us are really familiar with what happened next. Um, in other gospel accounts, Judas, he greets Jesus with an unholy kiss, identifying Jesus as the one to be arrested. But John made no mention of Judas's kiss. In fact, Judas has faded into the background completely. In John's account, Jesus is the one who is at the forefront. In verse 4, Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward. This mob did not take Jesus by surprise. He knew full well what was going on, and he didn't run. He didn't hide out in a different location to avoid the confrontation. He walked forward in the face of opposition with boldness. He went on to interrogate the mob. He says, whom do you seek? And in verse 5, they answer, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. This could just be translated, I am. This is reminiscent of God's self-declaration in Exodus as I am that I am. Jesus is showing these soldiers that he is more than the man they are looking for. He is God, the Son incarnate. And Jesus reveals his divine identity with this divine name. And as he does that, the mob gets a taste of Jesus' divine power. The text tells us that they all drew back and they fell to the ground. I don't really know what's happening here. There seems to be something supernatural going on. But what has happened is that these men have humbled themselves before Jesus. Once again, reminding us that Jesus is not doing anything in this passage against his will. He is in control. Well, with the mob stunned and humbled, Jesus initiates the arrest. Again, he asks them, whom do you seek? And the mob, they kind of come to their senses, and they again ask for Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus responded with a kind of edge and in order. He says, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. Jesus would allow himself to be arrested, but he would not allow his disciples to be harmed in the process. This was a partial fulfillment of the prayer that Jesus prayed in John 17. Jesus said, while I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction. Jesus would not lose any of his disciples. He would be arrested, but they would go free. But in verse 10, Peter was not content to allow Jesus to be, arrest, to, to be arrested. At least he wasn't going to let him be arrested without a fight. And so Peter, he draws his sword, and with a slash, Peter cuts off Malchus's ear. He's an unsuspecting servant of the high priest. And so that brings us to our first point this morning. Don't cut off anyone's ear. No, <laughs> that's not true. You shouldn't do that, but that's not really a point. Um, we need to ask ourselves, why does Peter cut off this man's ear? Well, we don't actually know. I mean, some scholars think that Peter was just being violent. 
Others think that he was being really strategic. Apparently, um, if you removed an ear from a temple servant, they wouldn't be allowed to serve in the temple anymore. We don't really know. Either way, we do know that Peter seemed to have these kind of well-meaning intentions. He wanted to save Jesus, but he once again misunderstood Jesus' plans. Jesus didn't need to be saved. He didn't want to stop the arrest. And Jesus explains this to Peter in verse 11. He says, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? Jesus intended to drink the cup that his Father had given him. But what is that cup? Why does Jesus want to drink it? Well, in the Old Testament, the cup that God gives is often a cup of wrath reserved for those who deserve his judgment. We see this in Isaiah 51. Wake yourself, wake yourself, stand up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath, who have drunk to the dregs the bowl, the cup of staggering, the cup of God's wrath. But this is not just an Old Testament picture. We also see this in the New Testament, in, in Revelation 14. And another angel, a third, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beasts, the beast and its image, and receives a mark on his forehead or his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. The cup from God is an image of the judgment and wrath of God that sinners deserve to bear for their sins. The father determined to give this cup to his son, not because he deserved it. Jesus was not a sinner. He, deserved, he determined, rather, to give Jesus the cup of his wrath to save sinners. This would allow any sinner who put their faith in Jesus to be freed from the penalty for their sin. They would not have to drink the cup because Jesus drank it for them. Jesus was determined to drink the cup in the stead of sinners, and he would do that on the cross. There he would drink the cup of God's wrath to the dregs. He would fully bear the wrath of God for the sins of humanity. And that's why Jesus is allowing himself to be arrested. That's why he didn't want Peter to stop it. He was going to lay his life down for his sheep so that his sheep could go free. So in verse 12, Jesus allows himself, or allowed himself rather, to be arrested and bound and led away. He's led away from the garden to the home of the high priest. The high priest at this time was Caiaphas. John reminded us that Caiaphas was the same high priest that suggested that there might be, it might be more expedient to kill Jesus than to let him continue his ministry, building disciples and possibly bringing Rome's ire on the Jews. One man should die for the people. But the soldiers didn't take Jesus straight to Caiaphas. They first led him to Annas. Annas was Caiaphas' father-in-law. Annas wasn't the high priest. He used to be, but in 15 AD, Annas annoyed the wrong Roman official, and he was removed from office. But it's likely that many Jews still viewed Annas in, in high regard. They still held him in high regard. They even viewed him maybe as the real high priest. So Jesus would have to see Annas before he went to see Caiaphas. While Jesus is being brought to Annas, Peter and another disciple, likely John himself, followed him, followed Jesus to the high priest's home. The other disciple was known to the high priest, John tells us. Maybe John's family was close to the high priest. Maybe John belonged to a priestly class. We aren't really told. But we are told is that John's relationship with the high priest uh, allowed him to have special access into the high priest's courtyard. And the high priest's courtyard was kind of like an atrium that was at the center of the house. And so John is able to get access into this courtyard. And furthermore, John, although Peter isn't allowed into this courtyard by himself, John is able to pull some strings, and he's able to get Peter uh, into the courtyard as well. He just simply talks to the servant girl who is standing by the door, and Peter is allowed to come in too. 
But in verse 17, as Peter, is, as Peter entered the, the courtyard, the servant girl seems to have recognized that Peter was more than a friend of John. She thought he also might be a follower of Jesus. So she said to him, you also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? You're not a disciple of Jesus, are you? She asks. Jesus had just been arrested. So anyone who was a follower of Jesus might find himself in trouble too. And as Jesus, as Peter is asked this question by the servant girl, maybe the words of Jesus in John 15, 20, maybe they come back into Peter's mind. Jesus said, a servant is not, or, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. With the servant girl's question, Peter sensed a threat of persecution. Now, remember how Jesus responded to the threat of persecution in the garden at the beginning of this passage? They come up to him. What does Jesus do? He stepped forward and he said, I am he. But in the courtyard, look how Peter responded to the threat of persecution at the end of verse 17. He said, I am not. Peter denied being a disciple of Jesus. And in doing so, he dodged the threat of persecution. Peter, after he denies Jesus, saw that a group of servants and officers, they made a charcoal fire to keep themselves warm. And at the end of verse 18, Peter joined them, trying to stay warm and trying to stay unnoticed. In verse 19, the narrative moves from the courtyard into the high priest's home. As Peter was questioned by the servant girl, Jesus was being questioned by Annas. Annas focused his questions on who Jesus' disciples were and what Jesus taught. And in verse 20, Jesus responded to Annas' examination. He said, I have spoken openly to the world. <clears throat> I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Jesus taught openly and boldly so that the whole world could hear his message. And even when he taught his disciples privately, his teaching was consistent with his public ministry. There's nothing duplicitous about Jesus' ministry. That's what he's saying here. And in verse 21, Jesus went on the defensive. He said, why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. Here Jesus was calling Annas out. Scholars tell us that when Jewish officials brought charges against another Jew, they were supposed to gather witnesses to testify to the charges. So Annas shouldn't be interrogating Jesus right now at all. He should have been grilling those who heard Jesus teach. And Jesus was letting Annas know that. You're not following proper high priestly protocol. Well, this confrontation was not missed. A temple officer noticed, and he took exception. He struck Jesus. Is this how you would speak to the high priest, he said? Jesus then calmly confronts the official. If what I said is wrong, <clears throat> then you should be a witness against me and give an account of my wrong. But if I'm not wrong, and I'm supposed to have witnesses testifying on my behalf, then why do you strike me in the first place? Whatever Annas hoped to accomplish with this meeting with Jesus, it was clear that it wasn't going to work. He gave up the whole charade of his kangaroo court. He had Jesus bound once again and sent along to Caiaphas, the high, the high priest. And then this, this goes to the hearing before the Sanhedrin that we read about in the other Gospels. But John leaves that hearing with the Sanhedrin. He leaves it for Matthew, Mark, and Luke. He doesn't focus on that. In verse 25, instead, he moves back to the courtyard of the high priest. Peter is there. He was still standing with the group gathered around the charcoal fire. He was trying to keep himself warm. But the more time that Peter spent with the group, the more they suspected that he might, in fact, be a disciple of Jesus. So they asked him for a second time, you also are not one of his disciples, are you? And once again, 
With the exact opposite answer of what Jesus gave in the garden, Peter said, I am not. Peter denied Jesus. Once again, he dodged the threat of persecution. But he wasn't out of the woods yet. In verse 26, another servant of the high priest came to warm himself by the fire. And as providence would have it, this man was a relative of Malchus, the one, the man whose ear Peter had cut off earlier in this passage. And this servant was actually with Malchus at Jesus' arrest. He saw Peter cut off Malchus's ear. So he's, he asks Peter, did I not see you in the garden with Jesus? Try as he might, Peter could not shake the threat of persecution. He was once again presented with the choice, affirmation or denial. In verse 27, sadly, Peter chose denial for a third time. And with Peter's third denial, immediately a rooster crowed. Immediately we are reminded of John 13. When Peter promised that Jesus would always when Peter promised Jesus that he would always follow him, even if it meant laying down his life for Jesus, and we're reminded of Jesus' prediction that Peter would in fact deny him, not once, not twice, but three times. And in this passage, we see that Jesus was right. Peter did not lay down his life for Jesus. When faced with the threat of persecution, he denied the Lord three times. Now, it's important for us to know that this isn't the end of the story for Peter. Later, we'll, we will see that Jesus had three measures of grace for Peter, but we'll have to leave that for another day. Today, as we consider all that happened in this passage, Jesus' arrest, Jesus' trial, Peter's denial, there are four truths that I think deserve a little bit more reflection. The first truth is this, those who seek Jesus will find him. Those who seek Jesus will find him. The Bible tells us often that if we seek the Lord, we will find him. Proverbs 8, 17 says, I love those who love me, and those who seek me diligently find me. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find Knock, and it will be opened to you. James, in James 4, 8, says, Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. We see this truth on display as Judas and the, and the soldiers and the temple police, they come into the garden looking for Jesus with their torches lit and their weapons drawn. They're searching for Jesus. They want to arrest him, but they're searching for him. Jesus, knowing all that would happen, stepped forward, identified himself, I am he. Jesus does not hide, nor does he cower from those who seek him. He wants to be found. Jesus wants to be found. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, you might be coming up with a lot of reasons why it's impossible for you to find Jesus. Maybe it's the sins you struggle with. Maybe it's the way you've turned your back on what you were taught as a child. Maybe it's because you have too many questions. This passage shows you that as long as you draw breath, if you seek Jesus, you will find him. Jesus wants you to find him. He wants you to fall down before him and receive him as your savior. If you feel lost or helpless or alone, Start honestly seeking for Jesus. I know he'll come forward. Christians also need to be reminded that if we seek Jesus, we will find him, especially in seasons of doubt. We can begin to feel lost. We can worry that our faith is too shaky. We can wonder if Jesus really is our Savior. Well, if we do, this passage reminds us that if we seek Jesus, we will find him. So in moments of doubt, ask Jesus to help you find him again. Fall down before him and know that he wants to be found by you. He has no desire to withhold himself from those who ask for him. Seek Jesus and you will find him. Our second truth from this passage today is 
Jesus came to drink the cup of God's wrath so that sinners could go free. <clears throat> Jesus came to drink the cup of God's wrath so that sinners could go free. This is really important. Why does Jesus step forward to meet his captors? Why does he allow himself to be arrested? Why does he sit through an unjust trial? Why does he allow himself to, why does he go on to allow himself to be humiliated and crucified? Well, he tells Peter in verse 11, shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? The cup is the cup of God's wrath for sin. God has wrath for sin. He hates sin. He judges sin. But Jesus came to bear that judgment for us, to drink the cup of God's wrath in our place so that we could be reconciled to a holy God. Drinking the cup of God's wrath in our place is at the heart of the gospel. But in recent years, many try to act like Peter at Jesus' arrest. They try to step in and take the cup of God's wrath away from Jesus. Some do this by denying God has wrath for sin altogether. They're saying that the, that the cup that Jesus drank was really the cup that man had given Jesus the Father didn't want Jesus to die for sins. He wanted, just, he wanted people to just receive the moral example of Jesus, but man couldn't handle it, so they killed Jesus. On the cross, the wrath of man was satisfied against God's self-revelation in Jesus. That's a popular argument now. But this is an example of denying the cup that the Father gave Jesus. It is not a cup from man, but a cup from the Father. Others try to step in and take the cup of God's wrath away from Jesus by de-emphasizing God's wrath for sin. Not denying, but de-emphasizing. I think this is happening a lot today when well-meaning Christians are redefining the gospel as something like this. The gospel is Jesus is the saving and reigning king. They say that puts the focus on the kingship of Jesus. Now, it is good news that Jesus is the saving and reigning king, but the gospel is more than that. Jesus is the king who died for sins and rose from the grave. Or as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, or as Tom prayed earlier today, Christ died for sins, was buried, was raised on the third day, and presented himself to many, all in accordance with the scriptures. This is the gospel. That Jesus bore the cup of God's wrath for us on the cross is a matter of first importance. We must not seek to remove the cup of God's wrath from Jesus. He said he came to drink it, and he willingly did so on the cross. Our third truth from this passage is this. The threat of persecution presents Christians with a choice affirmation or denial the threat of persecution presents christians with a choice affirmation or denial jesus and peter both face the threat of persecution in this passage they face institutional threats from officers and courts they also faced personal threats from groups and individuals jesus takes the path of affirmation he affirms his identity. I am he, he said. He affirms the Father's plans. Shall I not drink the cup? And he affirms his teaching. I have spoken openly. But Peter takes the path of denial. He denies Jesus' plans. He seeks to prevent Jesus, he seeks to prevent Jesus being arrested. He denies being a follower of Jesus. He says, I am not. And he denies Jesus' teaching. He lies repeatedly to save himself. Today, we might face the threat of persecution. Threats might come from our institutions, employers, governments, courts. But at least at this point, they seem more likely to arise on smaller, more personal levels from friends, families, coworkers. Each threat of persecution presents us with a choice to affirm being in Christ 
or to deny him. Let me give you an example from my own life. My first job out of high school, I was a salesman at a small mattress store, believe it or not. And it was so small that I often worked by myself. So one afternoon, I was 19 years old. One afternoon, two ladies, they walked into the store. And we talked for a while. And as we talked, I found out that they were a same-sex couple. They were looking for a bed for their master bedroom. As I was showing them different models, one of the ladies noticed that I was wearing a silicone bracelet. It was like 2005. Do you remember these silicone bracelets, the Live Strong ones, the yellow ones? Well, I didn't have one of those, but I made my own. It was white, and it's, instead of saying Live Strong on it, it said, Got Faith, Got Faith. Well, the woman, as I was showing her these beds, she noticed that my bracelet said, Got Faith. She read it out loud, Got Faith. Oh, is that like a Christian thing? And I paused. It was 2005. It was before the church started losing its way regarding sexual ethics. So I thought that if this same-sex couple found out that I was a Christian, they would feel really uncomfortable, and they wouldn't buy a bed from me. I felt a threat, a very small threat, but a threat nonetheless of persecution. And I was presented with a choice. Would I affirm Christ, or would I deny him? And I'm sad to say that I denied him. When she asked if I was a, if, if she, when she asked me, is that a Christian thing? I said, no, it just means faith in anything. The threat of possibly feeling uncomfortable, the threat of losing a $20 commission check, that was enough to cause me to choose denial. And I think about this denial often. I wish I would have chosen affirmation. I wish I would have said, yes, it is a Christian thing. I am a Christian. With every threat of persecution, we are presented with a choice, affirmation or denial. Some threats present us with the choice of affirming or denying being with Jesus. That's what Peter faced. That's what I faced on a much smaller scale 20 years ago. Or other times, like Jesus before Annas, other threats present us with the choice of affirming or denying the teachings of Jesus. Maybe the threat of losing a boyfriend will tempt you to deny Jesus' teaching and have sex before marriage. Maybe the threat of losing your job will tempt you to deny Jesus' teaching and celebrate Pride Month at your work. Maybe the threat of an unsettled home will tempt you to deny Jesus' teaching and not confront your child in sin. As a Christian, you will feel the threat of persecution. Jesus told us as much. And with each threat, we'll be presented with the choice to affirm or to deny Jesus. This passage shows us that following Jesus means imitating Jesus and choosing affirmation. Affirming belonging to Jesus. Affirming the teachings of Jesus in the face of persecution. And something that can help us choose affirmation is holding on to a final truth from this passage. Truth number four. The word of the Lord will prove true. The word of the Lord will prove true. In verse 9, we saw that the word of the Lord proved true when Jesus commanded the soldiers to let his disciples go free. He said he would not lose one of his disciples, and he didn't. They were allowed to go. The word of the Lord proved true. And the word of the Lord proved true in verse 27. The rooster crowed just as Peter denied Jesus for the third time. Even through this complex web of human choices in this passage, groups, individuals, institutions, the word of the Lord proved true. How does knowing that the word of the Lord will prove true help us stand with Christ in the face of persecution? Well, first, it helps us to prepare ourselves since the word of the Lord tells us to expect persecution. 2 Timothy 3 says, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. 
Knowing that the word of the Lord will prove true helps us to know that the fruit of being persecuted for Christ's sake is actually blessing and leads to a heavenly reward. Jesus said as much in Matthew 5. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Trusting that the word of the Lord will prove true helps us to know that even if we lose everything for Jesus, we stand to inherit eternal life in Christ. As Mark 10 says, Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, no one has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the gospel. They will not fail to receive a hundredfold in the present age. Houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and fields along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. Knowing that the word of the Lord will prove true helps us to know that when persecutions make us weak, we are strong in Jesus. 2 Corinthians 12. That is why, for the sake of Christ, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And knowing that the word of the Lord will prove true helps us to see that our persecutors don't have the final say. Jesus said he overcame them, so nothing happens to us outside of his controlling care. As he said in John 16, in the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. The word of the Lord will prove true. Thomas and his team are going to come now. They're going to lead us in a, in a song so we can close our time in worship. And as they come, I want to invite you to uh, stand and pray with me once again. Heavenly Father, we thank you for loving us enough to send your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, sent for us. Jesus, we thank you that while we were still sinners, you died for us. You took the cup of God's wrath that we deserved. We pray this morning, Jesus, that you would help us to seek you. And as we do, we pray that you would help us to find you and help us to find the forgiveness and fellowship with God that only you can provide. And strengthen us, Jesus. Build us up, deepen our faith, so that when the threat of persecution comes, we will stand in you affirming that you are indeed our Lord and our Savior, trusting that your word will prove true. It's in Jesus that we pray. Amen.